and we'll do then uh, a little bit of 5-5, five, five, whatever time we have, and then we'll do that homework quiz. Sound good? It's a kind of a normal, chill kind of Friday, as far as taking a quiz can be chill. <laughs> uh, questions on stuffs? Blake? Uh, do you mind doing number 35 from 5.4? 5.4, 35? Sure. Oh, what was it? Uh, never mind. You don't need to do it. It, it wasn't assigned. Oh, okay. I mean, we can do it anyways. It's not a bad problem. Whatever. I, I don't really... Um, well, we'll just kind of do the antiderivative part to it at least, right? So the antiderivative of x to the 10th is going to be x to the 11 over 11. And then what's the antiderivative for an exponential going to be? If we go back and we look at our antiderivative rules, uh, we have that the integral of a to the x is equal to a to the x over the natural log of a. So that'll be 10 to the x over the natural log of 10. And we just evaluate that from 0 to 1. And we'll stop there since it wasn't one we had to do, but like we did the hard part there. Mackenzie? 31 from the same section? Yes. Okay. I thought you said 5.1 at the first, and I was like, that can't be right. I don't think that was an assigned problem. Okay. Um, so if we look at this one... We have x times the quantity cube root x plus 4th root x. Right away, I know that I don't know how to do an antiderivative of a product. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to think about the cube root as x to the 1 third, the 4th root as x to the 1 half, or 1 fourth, and then I'm just going to distribute that x through. So when I multiply two exponentials together, we add their exponents. Cool with that. And now we're in a form where we can anti-differentiate. So that's going to be x to the 2 plus 1 third, which is uh, 7 thirds, over 7 thirds, plus x to the 2 plus 1 fourth, which is 9 fourths, over 9 fourths. And then if I just go ahead and do this, that's going to be 3 sevenths times 1 to the 7 thirds, which is just 1, plus uh, 4 ninths, and then 1 to the 9 fourths, which is just 1, and then minus 0, minus 0. So it's really just going to come down to 3 sevenths plus 4 ninths, whatever that is. I'm going to avoid doing the common denominators and grinding that part out. I think that you guys are probably pretty good with that. Does that feel okay, Mackenzie? So again, the big trick there was thinking about the radicals as fractional exponents and then distributing the x through, and then it became... Yep, fair. Totally fair. Uh, others? Mia? 5.3, number 73? Sure. Which one was that? Oh, OK. Um, So the first part of this is I would probably just argue this in words. I probably wouldn't uh, 
worry about the uh, trying to do this symbolically. And the argument's fairly easy. If x is always non-negative, if I take 1 and I add a non-negative to it, that's going to be greater than or equal to 1. Everybody agree with that? And if I square root both sides of this, since this is bigger than 1, it's still going to be bigger than 1 after I square root it, right? So that's basically this half of it, right? And then if I take um, this thing, and if I square root that, that always has to, the square root's always going to make it smaller, provided that this quantity is bigger than 1, right? So that's part A. I'm basically just kind of talked through the reasoning there. Is that, you buy that? Okay. Um, so for part B, the tool that I'm going to use here is, where's those theorems? Oh, they were in 5.2, I think. Yeah, there it is. That's what I'm looking for. So the tool that I'm going to use is this property 7, where it says if f of x is greater than g of x on some interval, then the integral of f is greater than the integral of g. So what I'm going to take here is I know that 1 is less than or equal to the square root of 1 plus x cubed, which is less than or equal to 1 plus x cubed. And based on property 7, since I have this holds, I know if I integrate this from 0 to 1, the inequality still holds, right? So the integral from 0 to 1 of x is just going to be x evaluated from 0 to 1. This part is just going to stay the same because with what it's asking me to show, that part was just that part. And then here it's going to be the x plus x to the fourth over 4 integrated or evaluated from 0 to 1. Well, that's just 1. Right? 1 minus 0. And then here I'm going to have 1 plus 1 fourth and then minus 0. And that's exactly what we needed to show. So I started with part A, and then I used property 7, where I can just integrate each part of the inequality, and the inequality still holds, and then I just evaluated the left and right ends of that inequality, which were easy integrals to do. Um, this was the, that would have been the tricky part, is realizing that, hey, I got to use property 7 here to justify why I can just integrate both parts of that inequality. But that's a good one. Property 7 comes up a fair bit. At least in terms of like these show kind of questions, these showy kind of questions. Yeah, no problem. Easier than you thought, I hope, right? I've tried to get better at picking the ones at the end that aren't just like a half a page of algebra that are just like kind of quick if you look at it conceptually the right way, you know, to just kind of stretch us a little bit on the conceptual pieces still. Plus this chapter is a little bit nicer in terms of the amount of crappy algebra you have to do to do stuff. There's not that much of it. Okay, uh, you guys feel okay here? Let's do a little bit of 5-5, five, five, and then again at 8.25 we'll stop and do that uh, work on that homework quiz or whatever.
No. No, this would not. I did, the homework quiz ends at 5.30, I think. Topics is kind of what I, what was my intention when I set it up. Okay. Um, okay. So, fundamental theorem of algebra, really valuable tool for us. It allows us to connect an integral with an antiderivative. The catch is, well, what if I have something like this where there's not, there's no trick, algebraic trick I can do to this thing that's going to allow me to distribute the 2x through and like turn it into something where I can just like find an easy antiderivative piecewise, right? Here you're kind of stuck with the product or at least like stuff inside of a radical, right? The big thing that I would be looking at is that specifically I see that I have a function inside of another function, right? I have this polynomial function 1 plus x squared inside of the square root function. Everybody kind of see that? If we're doing a derivative, whenever I see a function inside of another function, what do I use? The chain rule. Uh, when we're integrating and we see a function inside of another function, our likely tool is going to be something called u substitution. That's the uh, focus of this section is on this substitution rule, which is basically going to be allowing us to do the antiderivative of stuff that we needed the chain rule to differentiate. So what would we do here? Well, um, we're going to make a substitution. So I'm just going to take that stuff that's underneath the radical, and we're going to call it a new variable name. We're going to call it u. So now we have something that looks like this. The issue, though, is that I my integral is integrating with respect to x, but I have this variable u in there. So what I need to do is figure out a way to change this dx into du. Well, that turns out to not be too difficult, since I know that u is equal to 1 plus x squared. If I differentiate that with respect to x, I get that du dx is just equal to 2x. And if I treat du over dx like a fraction, if I multiply both sides by dx, I know that du should equal 2x times dx. And look at that. In my integral, I have a 2x and a dx. So I can substitute that stuff out for a du. So now I can use my antiderivative rule. And then I can just drop back in my value for u. And I'm done. Does that feel OK to everybody? So blah, 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 blah. This boils down to the substitution rule, right? So if I have the integral of f of, of some composition of two functions, f of g of x, and then g prime times dx is the rest of my integral, 
that's tailor-made substitution um, or tailor-made substitution rule. So let's just go ahead and do some practice now applying this. So let's say we want the integral of x cubed cosine of x to the fourth plus 2 dx. Where is my composition happening here? It's the cosine x to the fourth plus 2, right? The inside is what we're going to use for our u. So when I make that substitution, I have that. Everybody's cool so far? So I need to somehow get rid of this x cubed dx and replace it with a du. How do I do that? I differentiate with respect to x my equation for u. So if I multiply both sides by dx, I have this. But what's the issue here? Yeah, I don't have the 4. What am I going to do? Yeah, I'm just going to divide the 4 over. So instead of replacing x cubed dx with du, I'm going to replace it with du over 4. No big deal. Everybody's happy with that? And again, I needed the, just the x cubed dx because those are the leftovers in my integral that don't involve u. So I'm going to put the 1 fourth out front, and I have cosine u du. The antiderivative of cosine is? So the derivative of cosine is negative sine. The antiderivative of cosine is regular sine, though, right? We still have the 1 fourth out front, and then plus c. And then all I have to do is plug back in my value for u. And we're done -zos. Do you need to distribute the one fourth to C also? Uh, well, one fourth times a constant <laughs> is still just a constant. So you could write as one fourth C if you want. I would never do that. I just write as C, but it's not wrong to write it that way. But you'd never see, like, in the answer, it would never say, like, one fourth C. It would just say C. Okay. Cool. But it's not wrong to do that. It's still just a constant. Um, so again, the rest of this, the rest of the notes here are just examples of using this process. Okay? So we're just going to do a bunch more examples of this process. Um, so the first thing we have is the integral of the square root 2x plus 1. What should I pick for my u? 2x plus 1. And so that's going to give me the integral of the square root of u dx. And then we'll differentiate with respect to x. What's the derivative of u going to equal? 2. So if I multiply both sides by dx, uh, what am I going to have to do? Yeah, divide both sides by 2. Very good. And that's all we need. And I'll just put the 1 half out front 
Again, because it's an integral, I can just pull those constants out front and ignore them, basically. So the antiderivative of u, or the square root of u, is uh, 2 thirds u to the 3 halves, and then plus c. So now all I have to do is kind of just plug things in. I'll do a little light cleanup along the way. There's no reason to do that. I'll just try this. We'll do it here. And there we go. This is feeling okay. This is, I think, is the hardest thing we do in this chapter, which is pretty okay because this isn't too bad. Um, okay. So let's keep going. Let's take a look at example three. What do you want to choose as our uh, u for this one? Good, one minus four x squared. So what we have then is the integral of x over square root u dx. If I differentiate u with respect to x, what do I get? Negative 8x. So we have that du over negative 8 is equal to x dx. Is it okay that I combine that all into one step? We have negative one-eighth, the integral of one over the square root of u du. Now, one over the square root of u, I'm just going to think of as like u to the negative one-half, right? Everybody's cool with that? So I'm going to end up with negative um, square root. I'm going to put this all together. That over 4 plus c. Blake? Not at all. So far, so good. Still doing all right? Okay. Um, we'll do, I think I just have a couple more here. No, I have a lot more. I have a lot of examples, apparently. I have a lot of examples here. That's okay. Um, let's do this next one. What should our u be here for the integral of e to the 5x? Yeah, 5x, I'd agree. So I have the integral e to the u dx. Now if I do the derivative of 5x, that gives me 5. And then we'll just rearrange things. So that's going to give me du over 5 is equal to dx. The antiderivative of e to the u is just e to the u. And when I plug this back in for u, there's that. All right. So those first three or four, whatever we did there, are pretty straightforward, right? Nothing really sneaky had to happen. Um, this next one is 
we're going to have to do a little bit of sneaky stuff here. All right. Um, so what's my u going to be? 1 plus x squared. Agreed. So that's going to be the integral, the square root of u. And then I have x to the fifth dx. If we differentiate u, we get 2x. So I can say that du over 2 is equal to x dx. Okay. What's the problem here, though? I have x to the fifth. So this is what I'm going to think about here. So x to the fifth is really x to the fourth times x dx. So now I can substitute in for the x dx, but what's the problem still here? That, right? I still have an x in here. So uh, what am I going to do? How can I turn that x to the fourth into something with a u? Original substitution. So based on that, I know x squared is equal to u minus 1. Everybody agree with that? And if I square both sides, x to the fourth is going to equal u minus 1 squared. So now I can drop that in for my x to the fourth. Pull that one half out front. Everybody still okay with the substitution? That was a little sneakier, right? Because I had to go back and do the kind of two substitutions there. Now, how am I going to do this integral? Mm, I can't distribute. Because, why can't I distribute the square root in? Because the squared out there. Foil it out and then distribute the square root in. So just a, like a little bit of hassle, but like that's okay. And remember, a square root is the same as u to the 1 half. I'm just going to write it this way so I don't have to muck around with a bunch of fractions. Everybody's OK with that? So now if I do the antiderivative. It's going to be u to the 3.5 over 3.5 minus 2u to the 2.5 over 2.5 plus u to the 1.5 over 1.5 plus c. And if I distribute the 1 half through, 2 times 3.5 is 7. Uh, 2 times 2.5 is 5. And 2 times 1.5 is 3. And that's probably the way that I would choose to write that. If you wrote it like u to the 7th over 2, that would be all right also instead of like 3.5.
right? Same thing. I give no preference to those. Either is okay. Does that feel all right on that one? Little trickier, right? The substitution was a little trickier than what to do with that integral was a little bit trickier, but you write on with the instincts, like let's just foil it all out and distribute everything through and then I have a problem I can deal with. So write on. How about the integral of tan x dx? Now we remember we have the derivative of tangent of secant squared, but do I have a do I have a uh, antiderivative for just tangent? I do not, do I? Okay. So yeah, that's right on. Where did this go? I'm just down here. Thank you. That's where I left off. So yeah, so John says, let's rewrite tangent as sine over cosine. All right. Um, cool. What do you want to pick as your u? I would use cosine. I'd use the denominator. So the derivative then of cosine is negative sine. So what are we going to want? We're going to have negative du is equal to sine x dx. So we had to do a little trig identity thing there to get it to a form where we could use the substitution first. It's okay. We should remember those basic trig identities pretty well. We did a lot with them last year. Uh, what's the antiderivative of 1 over u? Very good. Of absolute value u, right? Just as a reminder. And then we just drop our u back in and we're finished, right? Oops. Did I forget to put the use back in over on this last problem? Feels like that's something that I would have done. Yeah, of course I did. Shoot! This isn't done. What was u again? 1 plus x squared. Okay. So. Sorry about that, guys. You should have hollered at me and be like, Mr. Gold, don't I have to put the U back in? Yeah, we do, we do, we do. So that should be our answer, excuse me. Oop. Okay. Um, so this answer that we left was fine. Uh, what else could we do with this, though? If you remember our properties of logarithms, that's a negative 1 on the outside, right? So that can turn into um, like an exponent on the inside. And what's the reciprocal of Cosine secant, 
So you could add that now to your antiderivative list if you wanted to, right? The antiderivative of tangent is the natural log absolute value secant x. That's cool, right? That's one that I can imagine happening more than once. It's nice to have those for the basic trig functions. So what changes now if I'm doing a definite integral? So there's two ways you can approach this, okay? Oh, what's up, Mackenzie? Oh, thank you. We'll stop here. This is a good stopping point.